All right, sorry of the recording a little bit late. My bad. I apologize. Um, so we talk about the Minjis. These are the outer, uh, the most outer layer. Uh, they the distant, this distinct layer of tissues. Mm. Uh, the inner two layers are called uh, an acroid matter and the pia matter. This contains the blood vessels that nourish the brain and spinal cord. So this is what basically functions and keeps it alive. We we know that it, it has to have blood flow. We know that it ha we know that it has to move around. And again, the heart keeps it everything alive by pushing through there. Uh, we push it through the spinal cord. It has the blood, and that's where you know if you get a TBI, that's an effect all the way down through the, the spinal cord. So here is the central parts of the central nervous system has the different layers as we talked about. We went over this. Uh, you have your skin, your fascia, your muscle. So all these can be cut, torn, ripped away, unfortunately. And then that's if you ever see the white shiny part is the skull. Um, it is kind of shocking when you see it because you're like, oh, Jesus, what is that? Um, and then you come down to the dura matter. So you have your anacroid, your, uh, this is your CSS, uh, CFS, this is your serofinal fluid. So this is what kind of leads out that comes through all up in here is it's jagged. Um, this is what you'll see when you, um, if they're bleeding from the ear or you, you want to grab that on that four by four, remember? So your blood vessels that keep all this alive and then your pee of matter, that's, what's, that's actually what's cushioning the brain on the innermost part uh, when it's cushioning it against the, uh, especially it's like a shock absorber. Um, I don't really want to say it's like a shock absorbing fluid because it still causes trauma if something happens. So we just, it's just another conductor. Uh, it keeps it all packed in there without any constant uh, forward motion back and forth. Obviously if we, you know, hit something or day-to-day uh, -day movement. So the cerebral spinal fluid is produced in a chamber inside the brain. Uh, and that's called the third ventricle. Uh, CSF primarily acts as a shock absorber. When when an injury does penetrate all the protective layers, clear watery CSF may leak from the nose, ears, or an open skull fracture. It's like an over rupture of pressure, and that pressure's got to go somewhere, so it pushes out that. So instead of pushing out parts of the brain, now the brain will swell and also cause injuries. So that's something we have to be careful of. So there's 31 pairs of uh, spinal nerves. I probably would remember that number. And they conduct impulses from the skin and other organs uh, to the spinal cord. They conduct motor impulse from the spinal cord to the muscles. Um, so here's the track of how it goes throughout the body. Uh, you have your spinal nerves, you have your spinal cord, and this goes into your coccyx and parts of your different lumbar, different uh, the vertebrae of the spinal cord. So you can see how it is, uh, it's protected. And it, it ventures out through the spinal nerve, through the spinal cord. And it has all these, like the brachial plexus, that's uh, big nerves that go out through there and maybe run down to the arm and uh, your brainstem where that's where it's protected. But that is also the most protected part, but it is also most dangerous because there's not a lot of protection on the back of our neck. If something was to happen and we get a, like a, a car wreck where you get the coup contra coup effect uh, and you could break your neck and several a spinal cord right in here. And just because of the way that it's, it's, it's protected, but it's not, it's not enclosed by anything else. So the 12 pair, pairs of cranial nerves, they transmit information directly from the brain. Uh, they perform special functions in the head and face, including sight, smell, taste, hearing, and facial expressions. So a lot of times, if you have somebody with a TBI that may have a spinal tear or a particular nerve has been cut, that, that's the area. Uh, you know that one of those cranial nerves has been disrupted into its pattern. And that's why that they have a, a disability that they're not able to show facial expressions or they lose their hearing because it may have had trauma or shock to that cranial nerve. So there's two major types of peripheral nerves. You have your sensory and your motor uh, nerves. Each one of them carries different parts of the thing. So the spinal, the sensory nerves carries only one type of information from the body to the brain via the spinal cord. The motor nerves carries information from the CNS to the muscles. So you have those, those one-way highways that goes throughout the central nervous system and it moves and now you know that they, which one it, it passes through. So the connecting nerves are found only in the brain and spinal cord. Connection, uh, they connect uh, 
these are where this uh, I know it says a simple message, but like so you have your um, motor sensory. So if you uh, you find most fine motor growth skills, like if you're like you get these cops that get in the shootouts and they they lose their fine motor growth skills. What that means is they're unable to they can visually see their fingertips touching their weapon and trying to rack it. But that's the reason why they're taught in school to grasp it with the hand instead of just the fingers and go at one motion because you lose those fine motor growth skills and you start to have issues with uh, transferring of messages because the blood flow is being sucked out of there to the vital parts of the body because it's that fight or flight mode, it's that dump of epinephrine in there. So the nervous system works uh, and it's controlled virtually all over the body and activities. So we know that we've talked about the involuntary activities, what we have to think about to make it voluntary and then the reflex activities. So there's different areas that, that are controlled throughout the central nervous system. But again, like we've said in the past, it's just unbelievable how some of this is done automatically and some of it's done just, we have to think about it, you know, this, you know, we swallow all the time, we blink all the time, but there's certain things like I need to move my arm uh, to grab that. And that's, you know, it's, it just blows my mind every time we go to talk about that and how cool that is, it just happens. Uh, the connection nerve is in the spinal cord from the reflex arch. Uh, if the sensory nerve is arch uh, detects an irritation stimulus, it bypasses the brain and sends a message directly to the motor nerve. Now here's a picture right here that explains that. So what it does, is it's, it's the message goes to the brain, but what it's automatically telling to the nerve to move, that, that's hot. We don't need to be here, that's gonna burn us. So yes, the brain recognizes it, but our hand moves instantly before we realize that. Now, some people suffer those um, rare formities to where they're unable to feel pain or they don't feel uh, certain things and they have those transmission gaps to where this is maybe part of this right here is broken. Um, I, I watched a little documentary the other day, a young teenage guy, he ha does not feel pain, like he's broken his arm and a traumatic engine and he had to look at it and it didn't hurt. Uh, like he was telling he had to have surgery one time and they had to do the surgery with him awake because there was they could not use enough anesthesia to put him under. Yeah, that's no cause not wanting to have those issues. Um, so the somatic volun is the voluntary nervous system that handles voluntary activities. Um, let's see. Uh, the involuntary is the automatic. Uh, uh, the nervous system handles bodily functions. Uh, it's divided into two sections, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. When confronted with a threatening situation, the sympathetic nervous system reacts to stress with a fight or flight mode. The parasympathetic nervous system has the opposite effect on the body, causing blood vessels to dilate, slowing the heart rate, and relaxing muscle sphincters. Uh, the two divisions of the autom uh, autonomic nervous system tend to balance each other out so that basic functions remain stable and effective to where hemostasis is, is met throughout the body. Um, so we talked about the skeletal. We know this has parts of two bones. Uh, we, we go into here is the cranium and the facial. Uh, it's divided into those two sections, or sorry, two groups of bones. Uh, the brain connects the spinal cord through a large opening at the base of the skull fracture, or the skull called the form magnum. We went over that before. Uh, four major bones uh, make up the cranium. We have the opital, uh, op opital uh, the temporal, the peritheal and the frontal. Uh, the face is composed of 14 bones. You have your maxilla, zygoma, mandible, nasal, and frontal bones. So uh, I don't think it asks anywhere in registry how many certain bones are in certain divisions, but I know that they're pretty big on the, uh, the spinal bones, I mean the spinal nerves, how many sensory bones uh, are there. Uh, the facial, I've seen those before and some people, some of the groups that I'm a part of, some of the newer ones um, go out there and have those uh, state, those test questions we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, two seconds, guys, give me a second.
All right. So we talk about the body's central supporting structure. Uh, 33 vertebrae are divided into five sections. You have your cervical, thorax, lumbar, sacral, and uh, coccygeal. And here it breaks it down. So I would probably remember these just in case. Um, it's not saying that it's, it's a mandatory thing, but you're going to need to uh, at least know which one's here. Remember the L4 and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. So if you have any fracture or break into here, you can actually uh, die because your diaphragm's not helping you breathe. It's not contracting or relaxing to cause air to come in and out. Um, that's one of the ones that I've remembered forever. Uh, this is one of the ones your coxal, you can break your tailbone and it never be repaired and it's always painful. Um, so those are some of the few that I remember like that and I've remembered forever. Uh, the frontal part of each vertebrae consists of a round, solid block of bone called the vertebrae. The back part uh, forms a bony arch. The series of arches from a tunnel called the spinal canal, uh, which encases and protects each spinal cord. The vertebrae are connected by ligaments and separated by cushions called invertible disc. So the disc is what you see that you can blow out a disc. Uh, they may have to do some fusion because the discs have worn out or worn down. So those are the things that you, um, now you know their placements. Uh, I wanted to say that there was a picture on there. Um, so scalp laceration. So remember, any time that we come across any form or part of a, uh, a facial cut, it's going to be super, super uh, bloody. You're going to have a lot of facial wounds. Um, I'm talking to y'all as I'm looking for that video that I have somewhere in here. Um, so just remember when you get there, it may not be as bad as, you, as it looks, but just because of the location, it's going to bleed like a stuck hog. So that being the case is just fair warning that it, it's, it's going to bleed dramatically. So, you know, take your time, assess it, um, control the bleeding when it comes to any sort of scalp injuries. Uh, significant force applied to the head uh, may cause a skull fracture. Maybe one, or maybe open or closed, depending on whether there is a, a overlying laceration of the skull. Uh, injuries from bullets or other penetrating weapons often result in skull fractures. So, we can have, remember if y'all recall right, we can have our penetrating trauma and our, um, our blunt injuries. So our, either one of those, is that it? I got it. Um, so though any one of those can cause major issues. So we have to be careful about that um, because we need to know that are we going to, um, and your mother messages. Um, so we need to know if it's penetrating or blunt injuries because that's gonna tell us uh, what type of potential skull fractures or what other pecan, what other potential injuries that are there. Um, if we start to see deficits from an area, we need to make sure we assess it. Um, and it probably is based because of a skull fracture or swelling to the face. Um, signs of a skull fracture, obviously if the patient's head appears deformed. Um, uh, visible cracks on the skull. Uh, you may or may not be able to see that because of the hair, facial hair, anything like that. Um, ecchymosis or bruising that develops under the eye. Uh, you have raccoon eye. We'll show you a picture in a second. And then you have ecchymosis that develops behind one ear over the mastoid process, which is called battle sign. So here you go. So this one on the bottom is is, rac is called uh, battle wounds, and here's your raccoon eyes. That is a indicative of a head trauma. Now, you're not going to see these initially. Uh, these do take some time to uh, form. So that being the case is we may, we're not probably going to see these in the field. It's just going to take some, uh, you may see this, I think, two to three days afterwards. It's the same thing for like a bruise. The bruise is going to take place over time, but here is because there's been soft tissues around the eye, uh, and that's why it looks like these are blown. And sometimes in their eyes, 
they may actually see the busted, busted blood vessels in their eyes also. Whoops, that button does not work. Um, linear skull fractures. So approximately account for about 80% of the skull fractures. If you'll notice here, it runs down the seam of the skull. Um, uh, radiographs are required to diagnose, which is x-rays, the linear skull fracture because there are often no physical. Uh, so if somebody's riding their bike and they slip through and they fall off their bike and strike their head, no helmet. Uh, it is, it is a, I say it's a mandatory anytime you have somebody that falls and hits their head, uh, causing traumatic injuries, they need to be seen by a physician and have an x-ray of their skull because it's, it's too much of a, an area to just not know because if it's something that swells and causes traumatic issues, you can die in your sleep and not know. So it's just as easy to just go get an x-ray of your head if you've had any sort of traumatic issues. Now here, a depressed skull fracture, you're gonna notice this when you do your assessment and you feel this, this right here, is gonna be uh, a deformity. Um, uh, it, it'll be a, an indention. Uh, this does result in a high-speed traumatic injury with a blunt object, and that's probably from a baseball bat. Uh, the frontal and the perennial uh, bones of the skull are mostly susceptible. Bony fragments may be driven uh, into the brain, resulting in injury. So these may, like this little section right here, may actually have penetrated the brain and caused issues there. So that's possibly going to create a deficit. Obviously, they're going to have to have surgery, and they're going to have to go to a traumatic issue, a traumatic a tra trauma hospital to have that. Now, patients often present with signs of neurological injuries, such as loss of consciousness. They've passed out. They, um, um, they go unconscious. They have all these underlying issues um, that, that is going to create that. So anytime that you go to a car wreck and your patient refuses. Now, the thing that you tell them is I, I've done it for years is understanding that it's your right to resign this refusal. I can't make you go, but understandingly that you may have nausea, blurred vision, headaches, uh, and just not feel well. You could go to sleep tonight and die. Um, and that's because of you not wanting to go get further treatment. So you understand those. You've been informed. You're more than welcome to sign here. If they still sign, that's fine, but also let them know that you like, that you have noted that in a report. So if there's any issues later down the road, they can't come back to you and come after you because you were notified that you could possibly die in your sleep or your loved ones. And that's the reason why at those times I specifically get somebody that it may be with them or maybe another dry, let's say somebody's come and pick them up to witness that signature saying, hey, I didn't make them sign this. They know, they understand, and they, willfully sign this on their own, saying that they take this da, 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 into their own because of injuries just like that. Um, basal skull fractures, these are the ones down here at the base of the skull. They're going to create a uh, so high injury also. These injuries generate from a, an extension of a linear fracture to the base of the skull and usually diagnosed with a CT. Signs of basal skull fractures include CSF drainage from the ears. You'll notice in the picture, you see the blood coming out. These will have the battle signs behind the ear and the raccoon eye. Um, those, you will notice that over time. Uh, somebody may just think, oh, well, I guess they may have busted their eardrums. Not, not really the case, but that's what you get your battle signs from. Um, so here's the worst one is the open skull fracture. Now, and the reason why I say this is the worst because you can have outer debris enter the skull. Those, uh, you can create an infection, uh, dust, particles, tree limbs, du uh, grass, you name it, can get into this open skull fracture. And it's going to obviously create a brain tissue to be exposed to the environment. Um, anytime you see this, you want to try to cover it as soon as you can. Put your hand over it, cover it. Um, you know, just protect the brain as fast as you can. And these do have a very high mortality rate, but at the same time is I've seen people live with them. Um, there's, there's been those issues, not, well, not live long life, but they've lived long enough to have surgery and have them fixed. Um, there are those just once in a blue moon cases um, and that open skull fractures 
they're uh, upwards of 80 to 90 percent mortality, but at the same time as they can live um, if treated in a right amount of time. Um, traumatic brain injuries, TBIs, uh, the two broad categories, or sorry, let's back this up. So the TBI is defined by a National Head Injury Foundation as a traumatic insult to the brain capable of producing physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and vocal changes. So that's what a TBI stand, represents. Now, classified into the broad categories, primarily direct injury and secondary injuries. Primary brain injuries result in instantaneously from the impact of the head. Secondary uh, is an increase of severity from the primary injury. So this is like uh, when you have your blast explosion, you have your primary blast goes off right here. And then your secondary is like from the skull striking the back of the brain or when it's swelling and creating pressure added to uh, the skull itself, creating injury from the brain swelling. So your secondary brain injuries uh, increase the severity of primary injury. Well, obviously, you have cere cerebral edema, uh, intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, you'll come across with increased intracranial pressure. That's the reason why sometimes I've seen that they'll go and they remove chunks of skull. And what that does is allows for the brain to swell on its own. Uh, you'll have cerebral uh, ischemia, uh, infections, obviously. Hypoxia and hypertension are two of the most common causes of secondary brain injury and will increase death and disability significantly in a patient with a head injury. Secondary injuries may occur anywhere from a few minutes to several days. Um, so if it takes a couple of days for the brain to swell and that's gonna cause a secondary injury. So then most of the time that you have a severe injury to the brain, they're going to automatically sedate you, keep you sedated so they can have time for the, the brain to swell and they can control it to where it's not something that they're, it's easier to sedate you and treat you and function for you than it is to try to watch you fight it and uh, have deficits that way. Um, neurosurgeons are freaking amazing. They know their stuff. They, they're very well. Uh, so it's, it's neat to be around them. Now, neurosurgeons, if you've never been in a room with them, they think they're God, so they want everybody to bow down to them. But knowing that you're doing your best, everything you can, you got them to the best facility at the best and the right amount of time, that's what we can do. Um, TBIs can result from blunt or penetrating injuries. Uh, we talked about the coup contra coup injuries. Uh, it's the initial impact from the part of the the front of the brain to the head falling back against the headrest or you know from the back hitting the rear part of the brain. Cerebral edema may not develop until several hours following the initial injury so you're going to have the swelling. Uh, low blood oxygen levels aggravated cerebral edema and monitor the patient for any seizure activity. So that being the case is because now that they've had this TBI this is new the body does not know what to do and they have all this swelling everything that's taken place and now they're gonna start going into seizures. Seizures is a telltale sign of a TBI, but at the same time, you need to be very cautious on that because if they seize too long and certain medication, that can affect the outcome of this potential TBI. Uh, cerebral edema may not develop. We talked about that. I don't know why it's been there again. We talked about that one. We talked about that one. I don't know why I'm having to repeat it. Intracranial pressures, the accumulations of blood within the skull or swelling of the brain can rapidly lead to an increase of intracranial pressures. Um, they measure the ICP pretty much uh, a lot. Well, every patient that I've ever seen in, in the neuro floors, they all measure their ICPs. Um, so what the ICP is, it's, it's what you see right there. It's, it's the pressure that squeezes against the brain, against the bony promises within the cranium. So they need to know basically how many PSI, that's pounds per square inch, is pushing against the skull versus the brain so they can adjust for swelling. Uh, if they need to go in there and remove parts of the brain, that's, I mean, not brain, but the skull to account for swelling, they'll do that. Uh, they can attach those back later on, but it's, it's, it's severe. It's not just, you know, it's not just an easy process. This is something that's going to be a long standing process for these patients to deal with. Um, 
So ICP is also increased in cranial pressure, abnormal respiratory patterns, such as ataxia, uh, chain stokes. Uh, you'll have a decreased pulse rate, a headache, nausea, vomiting, decreased alertness, bradycardia, sluggishness, non-reactive pupils, the celebrate posturing, and increased or widened blood pressures. Uh, the Cushing reflex is the symptom, tri is symptom triad of increased blood pressure, decreased pulse rate, and an irregular respiration. So to get this, you're going to have one of those three, and most likely those three are going to be predominant pretty quick with each other. So you're going to have the uh, increased blood pressure. You're going to have a, so the blood pressure is going to go to like 260 over 180. Those are super high. Then your pulse rate is going to be down into the 60s. And then they're going to start having these irregular respirations to where it's, it's irregularly irregular. So it's just because it's irregular, it doesn't, they can build a pattern after a while. But now that they're irregular, irregular, there's no similarity of how this patient's breathing, what's taking place, what's going on, because they, this, the brain is now not telling it how to breathe on a normal, fun, a normal functionality. It's just, I don't know what to do, so breathe. Uh, let's go to the breathe. Uh, and then it's like, breathe, 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 and then has a long pause of apnea. So that's, that's scary at the same time. Intracranial hemorrhage uh, inside the skull is, uh, increases the ICP. We know that. Uh, bleeding can occur between the skull and the dura mater, beneath the dura mater, but outside the brain or within the tissue of the brain itself. So it's like, well, where is this supposed to swell at? It just depends on what particular part of the brain is affected that it can cause swelling to that area. We well, like, what do you mean? So, huh. so the brain itself can swell. And then you can turn around and have um, the durum start to have traumatic issues. And then you can have the, uh, the blood start filling the air. And all those different pieces and parts can cause an increase of ICP. Um, and that's the reason why you're, uh, you'll start to see either of those three causes. Your, they can all cause your ICP to increase. Uh, you can have ones or twos of them. Um, so the lecture outline here. So epidermal hematoma, that's the accumulation of blood between the skull and the dura mater, nearly always the result of a blow to the head that produces a linear skull fracture right here. You see that. The middle mingual artery run along and groove into the temporal bone, arterial bleeding uh, into the epidural space, which results in rapidly progressing symptoms. Often the patient loses consciousness immediately following the injury. Let's see here, they've got the hematoma. So that's a lot of swelling right there. Uh, that's massive swelling because it's pushing on to the, I'm gonna assume that is the patient's left um, because that's where the injury is on this picture. Um, so the, let's see. So even though we know they're gonna lose consciousness rapidly, the, you may have a brief period of consciousness and that's very uh, referred to as a lucid interval. So they know what's going on, they don't have any idea, they're out. And they're very lucid about things. They don't, they don't pick up what's going on, they're crazy. It's just like they're speaking out of their mind. Uh, the pupil on the side of the hematoma becomes fixed and dilated. So that's a blown pupil and the other one's equal and reactive. Death will follow very rapidly without surgery to uh, eva evacuate the hematoma. So if this right here, is not removed pretty fast and it keeps pushing, it's gonna obviously cause damage and death to the brain itself, but the patient's gonna die because it's causing so much trauma in that area that the brain just starts shutting down. Um, so dural hematoma, Accumulation of blood beneath the dura mater, but outside the brain. This usually occurs after falls or injuries involving strong deceleration forces. Now, this is what you see a lot of times on your elderly people. Um, they slip, trip, and fall a lot. And this is what the highest rate of death for elderly is, is due to subdural hematomas. Um, they more common than epidural hematomas and may or may not be associated with a skull fracture. Uh, associated with venous bleeding, so it's very small. So the signs typically develop more gradually within epidural hematoma. So if you go to somebody 
an elderly patient and they're just not being their self, that's when you ask them and the family members around or a caregiver, have they fallen recently and how long ago? Well, yeah, they fell Sunday and you're like, well, now it's Thursday and they're just not acting normal. Well, you may try to assess their head. They may not allow you, but go with potentially of a, a, a hematoma. I mean, you're not sure where, but look for injuries uh, on the patient's body, maybe to their forehead. That can kind of give you ideas of what part of it is. The patient will often experience uh, uh, slurred speech. Uh, any patients with a suspected hem subdural hematoma needs to be evaluated by a physician, which that's why we're there. We're there to take them to get them to the most appropriate facility. So you have your intracerebral hematomas. These are swelling with the brain tissue itself. Uh, many small, deep intracerebral hemorrhages are associated with other brain injuries, and they can occur following a penetrating injury to the head or because of rapid deceleration forces. So a car wreck can also do this. The progression of an increased ICP depends on the presence of other brain injuries the region of the brain involved, and the size of the hemorrhage. Uh, intracranial hematomas have a high mortality rate, even if the hematoma is surgically removed because of everything else inside the brain that was involved. I mean, you got to think that's deep. So they're running. They're not just going to cut open right here, wherever my cursor went, cut open right here and go into it. They're going to run... Uh, Oh, I forgot the name of this particular little tool that they use. It's like a snake that goes into the artery and it snakes all the way up into here to where it's at. And they're watching it uh, on, on a TV as they're doing this. And when it gets to that point, it will it'll suck it all out. It grabs that clot and pulls it out. But the damaged area and is already dead. So it's not just going to regenerate. It's very hard to make it alive again. So you lose a lot of uh, patients that way because of where it's located inside the brain. So subarachnoid hemorrhages, bleeding occurs in the subarachnoid sub sub space where the CFS circulates. This results in bloody CSF. Uh, common causes include trauma, uh, rupture of an aneurysm. Patients report a sudden severe headache. Um, as bleeding increase, the patient will experience signs and symptoms of occurring uh, in increased cranial pressures. Uh, a sudden severe subarachnoid hematoma usually results in death. Survivors often have permanent neurological impairment. So these are the ones that's gonna be a more of a long-term, either it's a stroke facility patients. Um, they're, they're not, even though they're within the stroke facility within an X amount of time, they're, they're not gonna reverse it, it it's permanent. They're gonna have those deficits uh, for the rest of their lives. Uh, you see this a lot, sorry, let's go back. You see this a lot right here on uh, TBIs of explosions, um, military injuries when they've had head injuries because of the close proximity. Uh, if they're inside of a armored vehicle, things like that causes those ICP or the intracranial pressure to increase and the location of this uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. All right, so if you get smoked in the head to the rear, rear of the uh, front or the back, that's going to be classified as a mid-TBI. So it's a closed injury with a, temp a temporary loss of acceleration of part of all the brain abilities to function without demonstrating physical damage. Whew, that was a lot. I'm approximately 90% of patients who suffer, patients who sustain a conscious, uh, do not experience a loss of, con sorry, let's do this again. Approximately 90% of patients who sustain a concussion do not experience a loss of consciousness. So we know that they've had a concussion and that's the reason why the NFL takes so hard at that because it is a, it's, it's potentially death. I mean, that is, it's a very scary situation to where that they can die from it. Um, baseball has got into that place. Uh, I think hockey's the only one that's kind of laying back, but I'm not a big hockey fan, but I mean, heck, they can fight and not really get in trouble for it. So, um, but the concussion programs, even in high schools have gotten a lot more and more important. Um, a patient with a concussion may be confused or have amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is the ability to remember everything but the events leading up to the injury. 
So when you ask, hey, what were you doing right before this accident happened? I was driving down, you know, I-10, and everybody's like, you're on I-90. How you, what you, what you, what you talking about? So retrograde amnesia is the inability to remember events after the injury. Um, so they might not know that they pulled out. Uh, due to the location, uh, they don't know anything that they're involved in a wreck. It's, it's very scary for them. They get very traumatic, traumatized by it. And they're all like, I, I don't know what to do. So you'll hear retrograde amnesia a lot of the times after a uh, TBI event, massive car wreck. Uh, you have a fatality in the same vehicle. So uh, it's, you have to, I'm not expecting you to know all of these, but understanding the, the terms of these, when you see your patients again, you may be the lucky one that gets to transport your patient back home. And that is what that they're, when you want to look at their diagnosis. So you may be like, oh yeah, I remember the signs and symptoms that I picked them up from. And that's why. So it's more of an education thing is it's trying to educate yourself a little bit better every time. Uh, concussion, let's uh, ask about these symptoms. Do they have any of those that are on your screen? Additional signs and symptoms include nausea and vomiting, ringing in the ears, slurred speech, and the inability to just focus on a particular object. Um, assume that the patient with signs and symptoms of a concussion has more serious injury until proven otherwise, and they got to go to a facility that has a CT. Not every facility has a CAT scan. Um, a lot of places have x-rays. But anytime that you believe that they're a concussion and you're in a rural area, it, you're going to need to be able to call for assistance, get you an ALS unit there and transport to a higher level of, of care because your little rural Band-Aid station is not going to be able to support that and they need a, a bigger service, um, maybe like a level two hospital that's in your area that these are allowed to uh, get that CT done. Uh, a contusion is a bruising on the brain um, resulting from a blunt trauma. Uh, a contusion is far more serious than a concussion. The reason why is this involves physical injury to the brain. It, it, is, it has seriously it has hurt the brain instead of just causing uh, a, a bleed. Uh, they may produce long lasting uh, and even permanent damage. A uh, patient who has sustained a brain contusion may, may exhibit any or all the signs of a brain injury. Again, it's time to take them to a trauma facility. That is the most appropriate place that they can be taken care of. Um, so other brain injuries, we talk about uh, the signs of uh, symptoms of non-traumatic injuries are often the same as those of TBIs. Um, brain injuries can also arise from medical conditions such as blood clots, uh, problems with the blood vessels and high blood pressure. Other problems may cause spontaneous bleeding into the brain. So depending upon how high their blood pressure is and what medicines that they take and how long have they been taking that medication. And then if they've been involved in an accident, that's something that we, we got to keep an eye out for. We got to be very cautious about. Uh, next, it's not clicking. So let's talk about spinal injuries. Um, Taylor, this is a good part to stop. Let's just take a quick break. We'll take a... Uh, we'll see y'all back in, at, at seven o'clock. I need to do something to you since I just got home. So let's take a few minutes. We'll take till seven o'clock. All right, be right back.
All right. So let's see here. So we're going to talk about spinal injuries. All right. So the cervical, thorax, and lumbar portions of the spine can be injured in a variety of ways. So when we talk about that, we, we know we can have uh, back injuries, hip injuries, leg injuries that can cause compression. We have all those different types of injuries from an MVC that can cause that. Uh, you can slip, trip, and fall, uh, hurt your back, compression issues. Uh, all those different things have effects when we start talking about the injuries of your back. Um, compression injuries can result from a fall regardless of whether there's a, uh, the patient landed on his or her feet. Uh, so experience a direct blow to the crown of the skull, the coccyx, or top of the head. So if you slip, trip, and fall and you land directly on your butt, and it can be very painful because you can break your coccyx. And then obviously that's very painful and you can't fix it. Uh, forces that compress the patient's vertebra. Uh, the body can cause herniation of disc, which means they can blow the disc out that way. Uh, subsequent compression to the spinal cord and nervous roots and a fragment to the spinal cord. So once you, if let's say you blow out a disc, well, the disc and it shoots out a little spur, well, the bone spur can cause severage to one of the spinal cords. So th that's another issue we're talking about there. So motor vehicle crashes, and other types of trauma can uh, hyper, hyperflex the cervical spine and damage the ligaments and joints. So rotation flexion injuries of the spinal of the spine result from rapid acceleration forces. Where are we going? All right. So any unnatural motions can result in fractures of the neurotic deficit. Uh, when the spine is pulled uh, along the length, or you talking about hyperextension? It can cause fractures of the spine as well as ligaments and muscles. So if, uh, if you compress it too far, you, you pull it too far, uh, you get like the hyperflex. I, I always think of the uh, scorpion. We always see about that. Uh, those can also create the hyperflexion and compression. When bones of the spine are altered from traumatic forces, they correct fractures and move out of place. Uh, you can have your fracture, uh, full break, partial break, green break or a, uh, when it's, it's an open injury, it can, permanent damage may occur. We know that that may be broken and they may have to have a plate put in there. Uh, you have common findings, including pain and tenderness on palpations. Pretty much sure, because it's gonna hurt like hell. Um, if you suspect these types of injuries, take an extra precaution when you stabilize this patient, because they're going to let you know that that should hurt. They're gonna let you know that that's not comfortable. I need that. What you just did, I need it fixed, smooth, and not in that position. So when you go to scene size up, so you, if you suspect any type of spinal injury, head injury, uh, they need ALS care. I'm not saying that no one of y'all can do your job because it's not. I, I think y'all are going to be great basics and you're going to be able to assess your patients. But understand that these patients are going to need ALS. They got to do IVs, potentially uh, pain medicine. So once you bandage and pack this patient like you're supposed to, because this patient's on point and you've packed them up super well and good. Okay, well, now we need to move them to the higher level of care. So you've got them ready for the next level. So the paramedics there, they can take them and move on. Um, so be prepared, uh, uh, what's I say? Be prepared with appropriate standard precautions before you approach the MVC. Now, if you, if that's one of those that you need, you know, the, the gloves, the eyes, the mask, uh, be careful for that. Have your backboard ready. If Even if you don't need it, it's nice to know that you've got that backboard handy and it's ready to go. Uh, if that patient is like, nope, I'm fine. I'm up moving around. They're good to go. Then you, you can, it depends on your protocols. You may not have to put them uh, on a backboard. Look for indications of the MOI. What is their mechanism of injury? Why do I need to know this? Well, what type of injuries do I suspect from this type of injury? Um, consider how the MOI produced its injuries. What, what can I do to make it better? What am I looking for to improve this patient? How can I make them better? Because it's our job. We don't want to cause any further harm. Uh, primary assessment. Focus on identifying the managing life-threatening concerns. Because if we threat the circulation or airway and breathing, we stop. We fix that immediately. We want to make sure that that is completely done and, and we move on. So if we see that they're 
you know, an uncontrollable bleed, let's, let's try to control it. It's not controlled, let's put a tourniquet on it and then move our way on up. Um, reduce, uh, reduce our own scene time. We need to make sure that, that it's appropriate for the injury. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a traumatic injury, let's not stay on scene 30 minutes when it's not needed. If we need to be there due to extrication or unable to gain access to the patient in some form or fashion, then that's fine. It's, it's acceptable, but we need to try to reduce it once we're able to put our hands on the patient. Uh, be aware that an unnecessary movement of the patient can cause additional injuries. Uh, if you grab that patient and it's not a life-threatening issue and you go to jerk them out of the way and you created a, a, a if you've created that, the grinding of their spinal cord and they've created a, a, a twist in the nerve or a pinch in the nerve because of the way you've moved them, they're potentially gonna come back after you. They may look for you later. So it's our job not to create harm once we put a patient on, in our hands. Um, beginning the assessment of scene, determine the, ri the risk of injury. Is it safe for me to go in there? Then form a general impression of your patient based on his or her level of consciousness and their chief complaint. Well, I think they're gonna be okay. You know, well, I think this is gonna be really bad. Oh my God, it's a lot of blood. I don't know what to do next, all right? So if the patient is absolutely clear in his or her thinking and does not have any neurological effects, do they have any spinal pain? What about any tenderness, evidence of intoxication or other illness or injuries that may that mask spinal injuries? You may consider not placing the patient in spinal restrictions because you may cause more harm to them. Uh, the backboard is a rigid and often places the patient anatomically in the correct position for a long period of time. It may be best to just put them on the stretcher in a C-collar because that's more comfortable than being on those backboards. Um, apply a cervical collar as if you've assessed the patient's airway and provide necessary treatments. If the device needed to be removed, maintain manual stabilization of the cervical spine until it can be replaced. Um, that may be something you may have to get a partner to, you know, to help you do that. You have to adjust it or there's a need for the paramedic to do an inter, uh, they have to do a, a intubate. Uh, once the cervical collar is on, don't, don't move it, leave it in place. Let's, let's let that be there until the facility does the x-ray and they remove it. That's on them. We don't have to worry those risks. Um, assessing for signs and symptoms of a head and spine. So what happened? Where does it hurt? What does your neck and back hurt from? Can you move your hands or feet? I just want to know, is there any deficits caused by a potential back injury? Uh, do we hit their head? Why do we want to know if their head's been hit? Because now they potentially have swelling. Um, if they don't have any swelling, is the patient, uh, do they have slurred speech? Do they consistently ask the same question? Well, is that caused by the head injury? Um, in the setting of trauma, assume that your patient has a head injury until you're proving otherwise. It's okay to assume that because, I mean, we all make assumptions every day and we can be right or wrong, but it, I would rather be wrong and, and be better prepared to treat the patient in the worst setting. Um, decreased blood glucose levels can mimic these symptoms. Um, if your service allows you to check, check their CBG, I would say check their CBG as a normal ass patient assessment. Uh, move on through your assessment, check them to make sure everything's good. If it's normal, okay, rock on. Continue with your struggle. Um, if the patient's unresponsive, this is the one where you kind of have to do everything on your own. Move forward and, and I, don't, I don't say question it, but make sure you're Actions are appropriate. When I treat the patient, is this the best thing that's going to help the patient and their outcome? Um, what are we going to do to uh, treat them? Well, the patient's unconscious. They can't tell us anything but what we can see. So we have to go off of everything we can see and, ass and assume the worst case scenario, okay? Uh, if their airway, breathing, and circulation, if that is all intact, uh, when a spinal injury is just it's suspected how often you assess the airway. Well, it's important, so I'm going to say every five minutes, okay? So by you manually holding the patient's head while you assess the airway, if you can, I would not use a head tilt chin lift because you don't know what that jaw is. You don't know if there's spinal injury. You don't know 
what potentially can affect. So just use your jaw thrust maneuver. Uh, if they start to vomit, you want to completely roll the entire, you want to log roll the patient over to their left side. The left lateral recumbent position is also considered to be the rescue position. Irregular breathing, such as chain stokes, respiratory uh, respirations, may result in an increased pressure to the brain. So we already know that it's going to create an irregular, irregular respiratory pattern. So if we start to see this, and they, you recognize that their respiratory patterns are off, go, go forth and check on them uh, as you're automatically thinking, oh, this is going to potentially be a TBI. I need to figure out what's going on with this TBI. Um, and, and let's get them. So we want to reduce our scene time as fast as we can to make things uh, better off. Uh, administration of high flow oxygen, that needs to be given on every single patient. If we suspect any type of head injury, we automatically need to give them high flow O2. Use a pulse ox if we got it. Uh, we want to try to keep their pulse, uh, their oxygen levels to 90 to 95%. We, we want that. That's something that we want to try to keep to that level. So if we notice that it drops, it, it's one of those. If we've already got them on a high level of O2, then we're going to have to keep them at 15 liters and put them on a non-rebreather. Now, it may to be where we have to bag them also so we can help keep those levels up because they're starting to go uh, hypoxic and their respiratory rate doesn't have the draw that it does because there may be something wrong with the spinal cord and it's may not creating that uh, involuntary muscle, the involuntary coordination to make them breathe. Uh, let's see, hyperventilation is ventilating too fast. So use this, use only when a capnography is available. Ensure the entitled CO2 is level between 30 and 35 uh, millimeters of mercury. Now that is a, that's a little over you guys, but some of your levels, some of your services may allow you to, if your paramedic teaches you on site and you see capnography, but a lot of time that has to be done once they've been intubated, or you can put a certain type of nasal cannula on that will measure their uh, entitled. But the numbers, again, what we want to keep is between 30 and 35. That's our, that's our go-to numbers. That's a whole, whole, whole nother section to go over and try to teach that part. Uh, let's see here. So a pulse that is too slow is setting the head injury. Can and remember we have the the, the triad, uh, the high blood pressure, the low pulse. Uh, I mean the low pulse, and then we have. Um, so we they, once we get that triad, we know that we might start. You know we're going to automatically suggest that we have a a head injury. Um, assess signs for uh, signs and symptoms for shock and treat appropriately. If there's any type of bleeding, go ahead and control it. We know that is going to, that's a life-threatening issue. So we want to fix that on the front end. We need to stop it where it's at. Um, manner of transport. So are we going to make this a slow and steady? Or are we going to make this a uh, quick, fast, and a hurry? Well, any type of uh, traumatic brain injury needs to be quick, fast, and in a hurry, but at the same time, it needs to be reserved. We don't need to make this a unsafe for the patient. We need to make this a controlled measure to where it's sped up. If it's slow and steady, that's fine, but we need to be slow, steady, and quick. Uh, ensure that the patient airway uh, that has a patent airway and that you're providing high flow too. We already know that. We're going to put them on in there. Uh, there is a probability of vomiting and seizures, so suction should be ready as fast as you can. Um, maintain the spine uh, head, uh, the inline spinal position. Uh, if in supine patients, the head should be approximately 30 degrees, uh, if possible, to help re re decrease the ICP. Blah, blah, blah. So, if once you put them on the stretcher and you've got them uh, strapped down to the backboard. Elevate that head just a little bit because the pressure is not trying to just, of the blood pressure, every all the blood's flowing to the head. We want it to be up just a little bit so it's not uh, increasing the ICP and there's not a massive blood flow to the, to the tart, to the chest, and it's still got to get to the extremity. So it's not going to have to pump near as hard either. 
Um, on our history, we've talked about this multiple times. Take as much as you can, get as much information as is available. Uh, your sample, your OPQRST, your, all your different parts will give you more, more information to take this patient to the hospital. Uh, the better off you are. If you have uh, information, let, let's roll with it. If you don't, you just have to make it up and go with you. On your secondary assessments, guys, we want to make sure that we touch every single part of them besides if we are assessing them for a back injury again because we've already put them on the back or either they're already on a backboard. So we're not going to be able to do that. That They're, they're already fixed to the, to the stretcher. Uh, we we C-spine them. We can't reassess that. But again, we want to make sure we do a full head to, head to toe body uh, scan. I want to touch the hands. I want to touch everything to make sure everything is safe and I can control them. And if there's something that comes up once I have found it, I need to address it. Let's fix that. Let's make sure that I've got everything fixed, controlled, and we're going to move forward. So see your physical examinations. Uh, if time allows, perform the secondary assessment while en route to the hospital. I, I mean, you're, you're going to have to be doing these physical assessments as you're going towards the hospital. Your blood pressure and all that's going to be automatic. It's going to take uh, it may, most of your machines are set for every 15 minutes. This may be something that you have to remember just to reach over there and hit the NIBP. But again, that, that takes on its own. You can read those records later. Uh, your tools, your, your different, your entitled, your pulse ox, your, all these different tools that your service allows you to have, that is just going to help you build your patient care that much better. Uh, use them when they're appropriate and don't let them just like, oh, well, I forgot about that. You know, we could use this. Uh, we talked about DCAP BTLS, but remember on your DCAP BTLS, this is going to be to every part of the body, the head, the chest, the neck, the face, both the upper extremities. We're going to do the abdomen. We're going to do the pelvic. And then we're going to do both extremities of the legs and the feet. We want to make sure that they could have PMS, which is pulse motor sensory. If they're able to move those and respond to our questions, uh, we want to make sure that all that is there. Um, again, we, we note any things of, we note any changes uh, as we see. So those are, those are important that we make sure we get them fixed and documented uh, so they can be addressed at the hospital once you get them there. Um, a decreased level of consciousness is the most reliable sign of a head injury. Um, we know that they may have had a concussion that has turned severe. Uh, do not remove any, any impaled objects from the uh, open head injury. That is not our job. Do not probe on open scalp lacerations. Do not put your, your finger inside to try to mess with that bony uh, fragments in the brain. Don't do it. Uh, look for the CSF. Look for any types of uh, nasal uh, bleeding from the nose or from the ears. You can collect that, use that as an as assessment. Um, always, always, always do a GCS on any patient you come to as your glycocomma scale. Um, the member of the highest is 15, the lowest is three. If your jurisdiction uses the revised trauma scores, make sure that you do that versus the GCS. Uh, they, they may help you build. If you do both of them, you may improve on certain areas versus the other one. Um, and these are going to be documented on a glove, a note, or something so you can give into the facility or call in a report. Uh, let's see here. So there's your GCS. Um, that's how you give them their scores. Um, obviously, a deceased person is three. And then the best of all is 15. So I would say get used to this chart. You're going to use it probably for the rest of your EMS career. Um, until you get, until you memorize it, um, it is best to have it on, in like a little chart, so you know that you can refer back to it to make sure that you've got that chart documented correctly. Uh, when you start to write your report, you can refer to your little flip charts and a uh, little, little highlight things that, so you can make sure your reports are done correctly. Um, let's see here. So spine examination, we're going to do this prior to putting them on a bag board or anything. Y'all stand by just one second. 
Um, so when you do this, you're gonna you're gonna use your fingers to step down every part of the spine. You're gonna start at the waist level, and you're gonna walk your fingers all the way up. You're gonna walk them all the way up to their neck to make sure that everything is is documented, taken care of, and situated. We we because you only get one time to really assess that because once you put them back down on their back, we don't do that while we're in route to the hospital because there's only one. Most of the time, there's only one of us back there when we're trying to do this secondary assessment. So you don't have you don't have the ability to log roll them. So be cautious of that. Note anything you see back there, DCAP BTLS wise, um, and document where it was. Um, the, it, you're going to forget things. I'm telling you, when you go to write these reports, you're like, and then like right before you hit enter, you're like, oh God, I need to do this. So a lot of the times I don't close my reports out until the end of the shift. Even though I have completed them, everything is attached, I'm ready to go. And that is just because I don't want to forget anything as we go down the road. Uh, let's see here. So a reassessment, we know that's going to be every five minutes in our traumatic patient. Uh, we're going to continue to do that as we go. Uh, we transport into the hospital. Um, interventions, if you did something, go back and check on it. And if you did something, did it improve or did it deteriorate even worse so the problem is it i need to make sure that what i did improves their ability i never want to do something that deteriorates them but if you apply the tourniquet and you still have you know oozing or you can note that on your reassessment still noted um bleeding from the tourniquet as i was going um so document these if you notice a de rapid deterioration um, that the patient is deteriorating super fast, even though they're unconscious, they're maybe able to move things and, and it's just gotten worse. Anytime you do these assessments, man, document any of those little findings. Um, and there's a certain particular ways you need to add them to your report. Uh, your, your agency should teach you on how you do your report uh, orientation. So that's the biggest reason why I keep making sure to, to add to that. And uh, I'll go over doing charts at a later point. So if you do see a C, CSF, you want to make sure you cover that area. You don't want to like pack the ear, you know, but you want to try to you know, cover it. If your protocols include the administration of high flow oxygen and the, uh, application of a surgical collar, because you see the CSF and then parts of this, then just do it. Make sure that that is because you know that there is automatically a, a head trauma go ahead and knock that done. And the reassessment should take place as the patient is being transported. Sometimes it's hard to be standing up, bouncing up and down the road, uh, doing your assessment on the way to the facility. But again, that's something that you, you learn. You learn how to stand in the back of these ambulances. I know some of you have already done some rides, so I'm sure uh, you found out that you may have never been car sick in your life until you got in the back of an ambulance. Uh, <laughs> You, you didn't realize how rough it was until you started riding back there. You didn't realize the roads that you go down every day are completely different as you're riding in the back of an ambulance. Um, reassessment uh, shouldn't take you the entire transport to the hospital, but it should, uh, it should take you a hot minute. If that's what I'm trying to get there. So you're going to be busy the entire time at the facility, but you know it's going to be all good. You, you're going to learn. That's why you go through orientation. You go through things and you learn what your particular provider wants you to do. Um, on documentation, you should document everything that you find, treatments you provided, how the patient responded, and was the vitals re reassessed five to every 15 minutes. Um, you, you may be requested to testify as a witness, but at the same time as you, if you don't, if you say you did it and you didn't document it, it did not take place. So if you did it, you have to make sure that you documented it because these, these attorneys will, will mess you up. Um, we've done some, uh, some cases back and forth. Or I've looked at other paramedic reports during, uh, uh, I've come in as a SME, as a subject matter expert and looked at some of these reports. And it's, it's bad to see that what they say versus what they write, because you, it's, 
you need to make sure like i'm an over documentation fool uh there's a lot of times my my offshore docs like why, why do i need to know all this well it's not you is i want to be able to paint a picture 17 years down the road and make sure that i recall this when i'm old and geriatric i want to my wife's laughing at that so i don't laugh either so I want to make sure that we're good to go. Uh, let's see here. So the three biggest things we want to make sure we do, establish an airway if there's a head injury, control the bleeding, apply a, a, a adequate circulation, uh, assess the patient's baseline of consciousness and continuity to monitor it. What is going on? How are they? And, and I need to make sure we reassess that constantly. You always want to manage the airway by a jaw thrust. We don't want to just do a head tilt chin lift because if we did, we potentially can cause severe more damage to the patient versus just doing a, a basic airway maneuver. Uh, once there's airways open, if you have to drop a uh, OPA or an MPA in, that is completely fine. Make sure you measured, you documented, and it is in proper placement. Uh, if you secure the patient to the backboard, you need to make sure that it is documented on which uh way that you secured them you use spider straps you use curlex you use uh, a backboard strap you know those things need to be documented as you use those um so here's how you're going to basically uh stabilize the patient you notice they got their gloves uh and their mask uh, and she's holding the head as her partner is applying this this t collar um the patient is laying flat on their back. Sometimes you may have to raise the head up just a little bit. So the person at the head is always the one in charge, even if they're just the first responder and you and your partner show up here and they have the head, they're the ones that call the shots. Hey, we're gonna log roll on the count of three. I need everybody to be ready. Everybody's set. And you you follow their, their pattern. Now I'm not trying to say that they they make the decisions for the patient's outcome, but they, they kind of are in charge of that patient at that time. Now they're gonna assist you as well as they can because you're the higher trained and you always pass off to the higher trained uh, EMT. Um, remove any foreign body secretions or vomitus anytime you manage the airway. If they're ventilating, if they're breathing, are they breathing properly? Do I have to assist them in their respiration? Do I need to bag them? Well, we know we're gonna automatically put them on high flow too, so that's cool, but it, do I need to bag them is my question. Just because they're breathing doesn't mean it's adequate. At this point, when you start getting to there and you're starting you know, to ponder in the back of your head, hey, I'm just gonna have to drop an OPA on this guy. I need to go ahead and get the uh, ALS and route. I need some backup. I need some assistance. If you begin CPR uh, and the patient's in cardiac arrest, rock on. Um, active blood loss does create hypoxia. So remember, CPR, massive blood loss, and all this is going to take place because you're pumping on their chest. You may create that clot that was there to blow, or you may create them. But you, that's the reason why we want to apply the reg pressure and get that wound to stop if they're big enough and depends on the area and you got to do CPR. You can almost always control bleeding from the scalp laceration by applying direct pressure, which you should. It's very venous, so it's little. There's no arteries that run through the head. And that's going to be super easy to control. It's just, it may be a lot of it. So that being the case is it's like, I don't know what to start with. But finally, when you get everything cleaned off and wiped away and you're like, bro, you just had a two inch cut on your forehead. That was it. And it looks like you just had like a bloodbath. And those are the things we deal with. I mean, if the dressing becomes soaked, don't remove it, y'all. Please don't. Just place the second dressing over it and wrap it, wrap it again. Um, if it bleeds through, continuously bleeds through, that's okay. You just add more. Um, it, at some point, it will stop and clot. I'm telling you. We know shock is usually a result of hypovolemia. Um, anytime you start to recognize that, please transport as rapidly as you can because we know that this blood loss is going to create, uh, eventually cause death. So let's Let's get them to where they have blood hanging in the hospital and they have more help than just you and your partner on the dark, cold road on the side of December. So let's get them in the ambulance and get them moving as fast as we can because it is, it's something that we need that needs to take place as fast as we can. 
Uh, the Cushing triad, we talked about this a second ago, but this is the increased blood pressure of hypertensive, decreased heart rate, which is bradycardia, and the increased respiration. So you're going to see train, chain, chain, chain stokes. I'll get it right in a minute. Or biot. Uh, you don't really hear that word used a whole lot. You hear more of the chain stokes and managed shock. Uh, the biggest thing that you guys can do right out the gate is put them on oxygen. Control their bleeding. Uh, any rapid, any major issue with their ABCs and applying oxygen, that's, that's the biggest thing that you can do to help benefit this patient out the gate. That's what we can get you to do to help save lives as fast as possible. Um, let's see here, preparing the patient for transport. It, do they need to be secured? Do they need to be added to this backboard? Do they need to be fixed? and ready to go. It depends on your protocols, what your protocols say, and it depends on how you're gonna move this patient. Um, if they're on the ground and they're complaining, then I'm automatically gonna put them on a backboard and I'm gonna let the, the ED tell me what they need to do after there. Cause you know what, I don't care. They're their patient now, not mine. I'm not really worried about it anymore. I may try to figure out what the outcome was so I can learn, but other than that, it's on them. Uh, you may also slide the patient onto a backboard or uh, I'm not sure what a vacuum mattress is, but you may use a scoop stretcher. Um, and that's two, that's a metal stretcher that basically can pull apart uh, at one of the ends and you can slide it on either side. And when you connect it, it kind of looks like a dull teeth that has squeezed the patient together. Doesn't really hurt. Sometimes you can pinch. Uh, you just gotta be careful when you put it on. Um, there's a vacuum mattress. Does any of you guys know if your facility or your agencies use a vacuum mattress at all? So if not, I ain't gonna go over that because uh, I, I don't use them. Don't know what they are. No, um, we so, don't either. Okay, good. Because I, I try to keep up on things and I'm like, nah, I, don't, I don't know what that is. But so when you have a patient seated, you may can also use the, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a different thing that you can use, and I'm sure you guys have used this. We can also use them in pediatric patients, but you, you still have to be careful for this patient. You need to uh, make sure that you use their, protect their spinal cord, their neck. Uh, you need to gain access to them. Now this is using a KED uh, on our supine patients is not a rapid moving device. This is something that it takes time. It's very particular. It, it, it's something that is, is beneficial, but it's, it's mainly used on patients who are seated. Um, if a patient's already standing up, walking around, no, uh, uh, no, uh, not gonna use it on them. I will most likely have them standing, put a backboard up to behind them and secure them to the backboard while they stand, which is normal. Uh, the only thing that you have issues and start worrying about is when you go to lay them down, maybe on the stretcher or something like that, because they can't control. They have no way to control their deceleration down towards the ground. So they get a little nervous. Um, if the mechanism of injury indicates that you see that they're like, man, I just think that they should have uh, like some back injuries, bro. Uh, and just tell them, just be like, look, I'm really worried that you may be suffering from something. I've seen injuries like this before. I'm really worried about your back. Like that makes me nervous. Are you sure you're not having any tenderness or anything like that? Again, they can tell you no, shoot you a lot of BS. But again, that's, that's on them. Once you've fully assessed them and given them that option to go to the facility and they're like, nope, make sure that they understand that informed refusal and allow them to sign that. Um, if the patient is intoxicated or on drugs or uh, they have a, another type of distracting injury, we can call med control and get approval to transport this patient. Now, it may be against their will and explain, them, explain that to them. And, and sometimes these physicians will say, okay, you can transport them here against their will because it sounds like it's something that needs to be protected. Or at the same time as you don't want to use this against them, but we have in the past is like, you, you may need to be like, listen, if you don't come with me, the law enforcement's going to arrest you and they're going to make you come to the hospital and they're going to bring you to the hospital and then take you to the jail. So can we just please let's do this and I'll agree that I can take up the next seven hours of your night just to go get checked out. 
I mean, I don't want to lie to them, but that may just tell them no even more. Um, so, so here's our KED. Uh, if some of you guys have seen KEDs, you may have touched them, you may have used them. KEDs are great. They're super cool. Uh, they, again, they are time consuming. Um, this is the back side of it. It folds around and there's supposed to be a little headbed that pads the voids. Um, so at the same time, so imagine that this is flipped over. All this is green and here's the buckles. Obviously you buckle color to color and then the whites go through the groins. So that goes on the inner side of the legs. And remember, ladies and men, when you go to suit, when you go to tighten these up, remember for the men in the group to be very cautious. These right here are handles to help pick up the patient. Uh, there's also some uh, right down in there. There should be some down in here too, unless you're using these straps. Um, let's see. Good, Tamara, you all worked with them at boot camp. cool. So you can also use these for pediatrics as a, as a stabilizing device. I like them because imagine this is the back. So their head is gonna go right here and their body is gonna lay through here. So this, from this side to this side is where the shoulders are gonna be and I'm gonna tuck their arms on the inside. Now, again, it's not gonna be enough to where I can, I can buckle it and pull it tight, but I can use uh, some curl legs or something like that to hold it tight to keep them from moving around because not many agencies carry pediatric backboards. Um, they're just not out there because they're expensive um, and, they, and there's not a lot of room on a truck for them. So they use those for pediatrics too. Um, here's your backboard. Here's a scoop stretcher right here. Uh, if you notice right here, it breaks loose and down here it breaks loose. So these two pieces, and if you see these legs right here, can extend out or extend in, depending on the height of the patient. So this is your feet down here, your head goes up here. Once it breaks apart, it can make a V pattern. And then once you get it situated back underneath the patient, you can clamp these in. I will tell you from past experience, watch your fingers, they hurt. You can pinch yourself. These are just two different types of backboards here. These are old style uh, headbeds. Uh, they are fixed to here. The only bad thing that you see about these is if you have a traumatic patient and they are very bleedy and bloody and gooey and nasty, they, 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 it sticks up in here because a lot of people don't clean it real well. Uh, these straps are to be removed and washed, sterilized and all that. If you notice, they have a chest and uh, torso one. This is probably moved down a little bit more to the legs. You see they have the little buckles here that snap onto these little rings in here. And then these are just normal cheap L cheapo type styles. Uh, it's kind of goes across the backboard, circles back around and you can tighten it or loosen it through just the pull string. So those are just your two different types there. Most of your agencies don't use these anymore. They use disposable con. It's just, it's just cleaner and safer for everybody. Um, so on helmets, we don't want to remove helmets at all. We want to keep them in place. We don't, uh, if we're able to, if we're able to remove like the face shield, like let's say I have a football mask. If I'm able to remove the face mask and leave the helmet in, pl the helmet in place, then we can uh, maybe get like the sports, the trainer or something like that to unscrew the face shield. The only time that it should be removed if it is a life-threatening issue. Uh, we don't want to remove them just on every string, every just up and down the road, leave them in place as much as possible because it helps hold everything intact. And then again, high level of care can do that and it's outside of our level. Um, so here, so these are the only times that you can remove them. I don't like moving them all except for the bottom. I only like to move it if the patient's in cardiac arrest or if I have to intubate. Um, it, I, when it says it prevents you from properly immobilizing the spine, you can use their, their helmet as, as a headbed because of where it's at. Uh, it's easier to mobilize them with that helmet on, in my opinion. That's why I don't really wanna move them out of the way. I wanna leave them in place. Um, Unless it's a full face helmet, maybe like your, uh, sorry, but your crotch rockets, uh, ATVs, things like that that have the full face with the shields, uh, cross uh, motor cross bike, stuff like that. 
those are the time that you uh, because you need to gain access to that. But when you do it, it's a very slow, methodical process. It has to come slow. Get somebody there that knows that helmet. How does it? They need to know exactly how it comes off and the use of that helmet. And it's one of those. It's again, if you notice, it's super, super slow. This is not a rush, even though we need to get to the airway. Um, it, it is a two-person job. The technique is removal depends on the actual type of the helmet. I can't tell you how many different types of helmets are out there. I mean, as you know, you can look at 14 people going up and down the road and there's 15 different types of helmets on them. Um, and it depends if they've altered that helmet at all. But to CYA, um, always reach out to med control and say, hey, bro, uh, this is what I got. I'm having issues with da 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 da. He's got a helmet on. I, I really want to move this helmet, but at the same time as I, I don't know, can you please give me some guidance? Uh, and paint a picture for him. I mean, again, it's going to have to be pretty quick because this is a pretty important situation and I want to make sure to get it done and transport them rapidly. Um, let's see. The, alter the alternate method is, I'm not going to say, we'll just leave that in place. Uh, all right, so this is where my video was supposed to be, but I just realized on break when I paused everybody that I didn't save the video. Uh, I will find the video and email it to you guys. It's only like an eight or nine minute video. Um, it's pretty cool. I really want to show you. It's from a, uh, a brain uh, trauma, trauma doctor, and they talk about assessments of the brain, how to assess the patient and to make sure that everything is fine when you go to move on. I was really upset because I really, I actually watched the video like three times. That was kind of the reason why I said y'all watching a past recorded video. I wanted to do a uh, class tonight because I want to show this video, but obviously Chris Wally did not do his part. So uh, I'm a little upset about that. Um, that's the end tonight. Does anybody have any quick questions, concerns? Um, I want to ask about problems also with taking your test and recording your grades because I've been back and forth with uh, JB Learning uh, and they say that they've got it fixed. I haven't seen any other issues. I've been trying to stay on top of that with the ones that has had issues. Um, but uh, does anybody have anything that they want to talk about real quick? All right, folks. Y'all can have this for the night. That is your class code. Uh, 716 question mark 67. That is your code. Let's do this 716. Um, I did have a quick question if I may ask. Please do. Um, you were speaking about the helmets and things like that. Um, we had a football player in the high school my son was in that had a injury and went unconscious and they didn't remove his helmet. Correct. And that they ended up life flighting him out though. So I don't know. And, and exactly majority, because it was a compression issue, I can probably say if it was a football, either they were worried about, uh, they lowered the head and I say like the targeting because that kind of rings a bell to everybody. So when you, that they probably had a compression issue and they were worried about securing the head when they got ready to remove the helmet. So they had, they were able to gain access to him and he was probably still breathing on his own, even though he was unconscious. So at that point, I probably wouldn't have removed it either. I'd have just left it in place. Okay. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Listen, good luck to y'all on your test. I um, hope everything's good. We'll be better off on Thursday night. I don't feel like I'm more as rushed. I drove six hours just to fly home to teach. So uh, good luck on your test tonight. Uh, if you all have any questions, please shoot me a message on Discord, and we will go from there, and we will rock it out. Remember, class is coming to its end, so you guys are doing well. Make sure you stay on top of things. But if you need me, please reach out, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening, and stay safe to everybody. You all have a good night.